Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 16 The Columbiad. Had the casting succeeded? They were reduced to mere conjecture. There was, indeed, every reason to expect success, since the mold had absorbed the entire mass of the molten metal. Still, some considerable time must elapse before they could arrive at any certainty upon the matter. The patience of the members of the gun club was sorely tried during this period of time. But they could do nothing. J.T. Maston escaped roasting by a miracle. Fifteen days after the casting, an immense column of smoke was still rising in the open sky, and the ground burned the soles of the feet within a radius of two hundred feet round the summit of Stones Hill. It was impossible to approach nearer. All they could do was to wait with what patience they might. "'Here we are at the 10th of August,' exclaimed J. T. Maston one morning. "'Only four months to the 1st of December. We shall never be ready in time.' Barbicane said nothing, but his silence covered serious irritation. However, daily observations revealed a certain change going on in the state of the ground. About the 15th of August, the vapors ejected had sensibly diminished in intensity and thickness. Some days afterward the earth exhaled only a slight puff of smoke, the last breath of the monster enclosed within its circle of stone. Little by little the belt of heat contracted, until, on the 22nd of August, Barbicane, his colleagues, and the engineer were enabled to set foot on the iron sheet which lay level upon the summit of Stones Hill. "'At last!' exclaimed the president of the gun club, with an immense sigh of relief. The work was resumed the same day. They proceeded at once to extract the interior mold for the purpose of clearing out the boring of the piece." Pickaxes and boring irons were set to work without intermission. The clayey and sandy soils had acquired extreme hardness under the action of the heat, but by the aid of the machines the rubbish on being dug out was rapidly carted away on railway wagons, and such was the ardor of the work, so persuasive the arguments of Barbicane's dollars, that by the 3rd of September all traces of the mold had entirely disappeared." Immediately the operation of boring was commenced, and by the aid of powerful machines, a few weeks later, the inner surface of the immense tube had been rendered perfectly cylindrical, and the bore of the piece had acquired a thorough polish. At length, on the 22nd of September, less than a twelve-month after Barbicane's original proposition, the enormous weapon, accurately bored, and exactly vertically pointed, was ready for work. There was only the moon now to wait for, and they were pretty sure that she would not fail in the rendezvous. The ecstasy of J. T. Maston knew no bounds, and he narrowly escaped a frightful fall while staring down the tube. But for the strong hand of Colonel Bloomsbury, the worthy secretary, like a modern Aristratus, would have found his death in the depths of the Columbiad. The cannon was then finished. There was no possible doubt as to its perfect completion. So, on the 6th of October, Captain Nicholl opened an account between himself and President Barbicane, in which he debited himself to the latter in the sum of two thousand dollars. One may believe that the captain's wrath was increased to its highest point, and must have made him seriously ill. However, he had still three bets of three, four, and five thousand dollars, respectively, and if he gained two out of these, his position would not be very bad. But the money question did not enter into his calculations. It was the success of his rival in casting a cannon against which iron plates sixty feet thick would have been ineffectual that dealt him a terrible blow. After the 23rd of September, the enclosure of Stones Hill was thrown open to the public, and it will be easily imagined what was the concourse of visitors to this spot. There was an incessant flow of people to and from Tampa Town and the place, which resembled a procession, or rather, in fact, a pilgrimage. It was already clear to be seen that, on the day of the experiment itself, the aggregate of spectators would be counted by millions, for they were already arriving from all parts of the earth upon this narrow strip of promontory. Europe was emigrating to America. 
Up to that time, however, it must be confessed, the curiosity of the numerous comers was but scantily gratified. Most had counted upon witnessing the spectacle of the casting, and they were treated to nothing but smoke. This was sorry food for hungry eyes, but Barbicane would admit no one to that operation. Then ensued grumbling, discontent, murmurs. They blamed the president, taxed him with dictatorial conduct. His proceedings were declared un-American. There was very nearly a riot round Stones Hill, but Barbicane remained inflexible. When, however, the Columbiad was entirely finished, this state of closed doors could no longer be maintained. Besides, it would have been bad taste, and even imprudence, to affront the public feeling. Barbicane, therefore, opened the enclosure to all comers, but, true to his practical disposition, he determined to coin money out of the public curiosity. It was something, indeed, to be enabled to contemplate this immense columbiad, but to descend into its depths, this seemed to the Americans the ne plus ultra of earthly felicity. Consequently, there was not one curious spectator who was not willing to give himself the treat of visiting the interior of this great metallic abyss. Baskets suspended from steam cranes permitted them to satisfy their curiosity. There was a perfect mania. Women, children, old men, all made it a point of duty to penetrate the mysteries of the colossal gun. The fare for the descent was fixed at five dollars per head, and despite this high charge, during the two months which preceded the experiment, the influx of visitors enabled the gun club to pocket nearly five hundred thousand dollars. It is needless to say that the first visitors of the Columbiad were the members of the gun club. This privilege was justly reserved for that illustrious body. The ceremony took place on the 25th of September. A basket of honor took down the President, J.T. Maston, Major Elphinstone, General Morgan, Colonel Bloomsbury, and other members of the club, to the number of ten in all. How hot it was at the bottom of that long tube of metal! They were half suffocated. But what delight! What ecstasy! A table had been laid with six covers on the massive stone which formed the bottom of the Columbiad, and lighted by a jet of electric light, resembling that of day itself. Numerous exquisite dishes, which seemed to descend from heaven, were placed successively before the guests, and the richest wines of France flowed in profusion during this splendid repast, served nine hundred feet beneath the surface of the earth. The festival was animated, not to say somewhat noisy. Toasts flew backward and forward. They drank to the earth and to her satellite, to the gun club, the union, the moon, Diana, Phoebe, Selene, the peaceful courier of the night. All the hurrahs, carried upward upon the sonorous waves of the immense acoustic tube, arrived with the sound of thunder at its mouth, and the multitude ranged round Stones Hill heartily united their shouts with those of the ten revellers hidden from view at the bottom of the gigantic Columbiad. J. T. Maston was no longer master of himself. Whether he shouted or gesticulated, ate or drank most, would be a difficult matter to determine. At all events, he would not have given his place up for an empire, not even if the cannon, loaded, primed, and fired at that very moment, were to blow him in pieces into the planetary world. CHAPTER Seventeen, A TELEGRAPHIC DISPATCH The great works undertaken by the gun club had now virtually come to an end, and two months still remained before the day for the discharge of the shot to the moon. To the general impatience these two months appeared as long as years. Hitherto the smallest details of the operation had been daily chronicled by the journals, which the public devoured with eager eyes. Just at this moment a circumstance, the most unexpected, the most extraordinary and incredible, occurred to rouse afresh their panting spirits, and to throw every mind into a state of the most violent excitement. One day, the 30th of September, at 3.47 p.m., a telegram, transmitted by cable from Valencia, Ireland, to Newfoundland and the American mainland, arrived at the address of President Barbicane. 
The President tore open the envelope, read the dispatch, and, despite his remarkable powers of self-control, his lips turned pale and his eyes grew dim on reading the twenty words of this telegram. Here is the text of the dispatch, which figures now in the archives of the Gun Club. France, Paris, 30 September, 4 a.m. Barbicane, Tampa Town, Florida, United States. Substitute for your spherical shell a cylindro-conical projectile. I shall go inside. Shall arrive by steamer Atlanta. Michel Ardan End of chapter 17